Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today I'm going to tell you about five lab life hacks. So the first life hack is one of my favorites, and it's using these 1420 rubber septa. So if you have one septa, it's called a septum, if you've never worked with septa before. You can also call them other things like septums, but most of the time people call them septa. And so it can be a little bit hard to find the old school ones that look like this, because normally if you buy a 1420 one uh, now, you'll get these like dinky little tiny ones that are literally only useful as a 1420. Now the cool thing about these older ones is they're basically more valuable than gold and you know why? Because you can attach them onto a one dram vial like this where you put the 1420 part around the outer part of the vial uh, where the cap would go and then you stick a needle in and it's important to use a wide mouth needle like the widest mouth needle that your lab has. This is I believe a 16 gauge one. And then you can stick it onto a 2440 adapter. And so this means you can put stuff in vials and rotovap. And it's just important to have a little bit of space where the needle goes through the septum so that you're able to evaporate off solvent on the rotovap. Now, if you use like a smaller needle, uh, like one of the yellow ones, which I believe is like a 20 or 21 gauge, it's a little bit slower. So the, the wider the bore of the needle, the better it is at evaporating stuff. And so while this is pretty good for rotovapping stuff down right into the vial that you're going to like keep your compound in, you can also do it into a 20 mil vial if you have more sample. And so this is a nice, really useful trick. It's very, very useful because afterwards you can just connect this onto a vacuum line and high vac it off. Okay, so this is a really useful trick. You can use it on other stuff as well, but it just so happens that this one type of septum is able to work on a 2440 where the, where the other end is able to go around the 2440. However, when you reverse it, the inside 1420 part is able to slip inside and fit perfectly and snugly inside of the inside of a 2440. So this is really useful for rotovapping stuff. Now the next trick uh, afterwards, I'm just going to show you a couple of other pictures, is you can use the same the same trick for an Eppendorf. So if you have stuff that's like uh, unstable in glass or you need to just concentrate down a sample, you can do it like this and then afterwards you can just um, use a vortexer to resuspend to get rid of any uh you know solvent that's mixed around and then um, re-centrifuge it down and then high vac it again and so you can see here that we have a one mil syringe with the end cut off this can just slip into some tigon tubing and then you can set it up to a schlank manifold and so then when you want to take stuff off you can backfill with nitrogen and this should just uh, fall off very easily but while this is under vacuum the vacuum will actually hold it in place so you can do this with other septa as well. You just need to make sure that you pull a vacuum first before you let go. However, it just so happens with these orange septa that they fit really snugly on the outside, on the inside uh, of a 2440, as well as on the outside of a 20 mil vial uh, or the outside of a one dram vial. So it's super useful. Here you can see an example of an oil being high vac carefully on its side. However, I would always recommend that you uh, high vac with a three fingered clap so that your vial doesn't fall over and you don't suck any of your stuff up into the vacuum line. Okay, so the next trick is to use these chem glass heat blocks. You don't necessarily need to use ones from chem glass. There's also other versions of these where you can get ones that take up like the quarter, a quarter of the hot plate so that you can fit like an RBF on them or a specific vial type. But you can also get ones that are like this where you can fit 20 mil vials. Here it says 30 mil because the 30 mil vials are just a taller version of the 20 mils. We routinely run reactions on a hot plate like this. They also have a spot that perfectly fits the probe for an ICA plate. Probably this would also work with other hot plate designs. And there's also a slightly larger hole, which is the exact size of an NMR tube. So you can fit an NMR tube in there if you need to run an NMR tube reaction. So this also works for one dram vials. If you buy one for uh, one dram vials, this is like a really convenient way to set up a lot of screening reactions, especially if you're just analyzing them by LCMS, uh, doing crude NMRs, GCMS, etc. This is like a really nice trick as long as you have enough stir bars for all of your vials. Most of the time, I'd say we only run like maybe four to six reactions on these at a time. But if they're all uh, just screening reactions, all done under the same temperature, this can be really, really convenient. And you get much better heating and you don't have to worry about your vials falling over. Now, another really useful heating trick is to use armor beads. There's other metal beads that exist that you can use, but armor beads are some aluminum uh, chrome plated alloy, which is able to tolerate decently high temperatures. Here we're just using it in an evaporating dish. And so you can run reactions in these, you can put an RBF in there, you can also put um, vials in there if you don't have one of those aluminum heat blocks I was just talking about. Quite oftentimes, if you just want to try some of these, you can contact suppliers and they'll send you a free sample. Um, they also have their proprietary armor bead heating bath Re like reservoirs, but I don't know anyone who actually uses those. If you do use those though, let me know down in the comments. So here you can just see like a typical reaction being run with a condenser, just a reflux, and this is just being done in armor beads instead of an oil bath. 
So you might be worried that uh, this isn't as good at heating because you don't have as good surface area. But the thing that's worth considering is the metal is a much better conductor than oil. So even though you have less surface area, you're going to get better heat transfer. Now, the one disadvantage is because I'm using a glass um, evaporating dish to contain all of these here, the glass is the main limiting factor because the hot plate can be way hotter. The glass is acting as a bit of an insulator. However, the armor beads, once they're heated, provide a very good heat source. So the only thing that could be improved here is if a metal uh, bath was used with a flat bottom that made good con contact with the uh, heat plate, that would make it easier for the heat to get transferred to the RBF. But overall, I would say these are massively better than an oil bath because after you take stuff out of an oil bath, you have to carefully wipe stuff off. And if you're not careful, you might contaminate your stuff with oil and it could just make a big mess. So I, I personally prefer armor beads. If you haven't tried them and you have access to them, I definitely recommend you give them a shot. Now, the next trick is using a digital thermometer. If you've watched any YouTube chemistry people, uh, you'll definitely be familiar with this type of thermometer probe. I had seen some YouTube chemistry videos using these for distillations and so on. So I decided to invest in some. They're very, very cheap. I think they're less than $4 each on Amazon. And uh, what I've done here is I've just immersed the probe in an NMR tube with a little bit of aluminum foil to improve the contact between the probe and the NMR tube itself so that if liquid condenses on this, you'll get a better read. And then I've just put a little bit of electrical tape on the top to just keep it shut. There are other solutions that you've seen uh, that you could see on YouTube for different people. Um, however, this is the solution that I found works best for me. So this is a case where I was uh, distilling over dye lime through a fractioning column, and uh, I was able to do this very easily. Now, the one consideration is if you're going to use um, some sort of distillation apparatus, you just need to make sure that you have a cork which can form a seal around your NMR tube or whatever you're going to put to enclose your probe. And so in my case, I just bored a hole in a very small septum, and I found one that fits but that's you know something you can figure out yourself. Additionally, you can just keep the NMR tube like paired with that uh, stopper, and then it's just a pair that you can always use together. Uh, yep, relatively straightforward. I, I've found that this is much more reliable than the alcohol thermometers, and it's much more responsive to slight changes in temperature. So with alcohol thermometers or even with mercury ones, you get a bit of latency. Mercury is definitely better in terms of less latency, but in the case of the uh, thermocouple like this, it's just super easy. Uh, if you haven't tried them, I definitely recommend using these if you ever have to do distillations. It's just way better. Even if it's off by a couple degrees, the responsiveness is just much better than you get in a typical alcohol thermometer. Okay, so the next and final one is the DIY NMR tube cleaner. So you might be familiar with cleaning NMR tubes by hand. If you've ever had to do that, you'll know that it just gets your gloves covered in acetone and then you need to change your gloves because your gloves swell or you just put up with getting stuff on your gloves, which isn't great. However, you can also get like a glass NMR tube cleaner, except in my experience, it's usually undergrads who break them. So yeah, it's not great. Not a great, not a great solution. However, what you could do is you can get one of those lecture bottles and just cut off the bottom of it. And if you bore a slight hole in the spraying nozzle of the, the bottle, you can run some tubing through it. So this is just some clear, uh, polyvinyl or PTFE tubing. And, uh, Essentially, this just sticks out. You can manipulate it a little bit. If the hole is the right size, you can like pull it out a little bit, push it in a little bit, depending on how long your NMR tubes are. And essentially what you want to do is you want to get the tube just right down, right to the very end of the NMR tube, okay? And so what happens is if you run this PTFE tubing into the top of a, uh, a, a, a flask with a sidearm, what can happen is when you pull a vacuum on the sidearm, it will actually just pull a vacuum through the whole flask, through that PTFE tubing, and through your NMR tube. So if you put a little bit of solvent in here, as I've shown in this demonstration here, you spray the solvent in here, it gets sucked up around the inside of the NMR tube, and then it goes into the PTFE tubing at the very top, and that sucks it down into the filter flask, which you just have to empty out after you're done. And so this is a really, really cheap and easy way to get an NMR tube cleaner. There are more efficient ways to clean lots of NMR tubes. If you're interested in me covering the uh, the very useful desiccator NMR tube cleaning method in the future, I'd be happy to make a video on that. It's a very useful method that I've used, and the more NMR tubes you have to clean, the more efficient it is to use the desiccator method. But if you just have to clean like five or ten, this is definitely a really quick and easy way. So hopefully this has been a useful video on some lab life hacks. It would really help out the channel if you left a like and subscribed, and I hope you have a great day.